Let me introduce myself properly. Debwe and Tishnakaz, Ashkigamang and Dojaba, Mississauga and Dao, Ojibwe, Nishnabe and Dao, Makwa Dodem. Debwe speaks truth is my name. Ashkigamang, Kerb Lake First Nation is where I am from. I am Mississauga. I am Ojibwe, Nishnabe. Bear is my clan. My English name is Mike Ormsby. Toronto is the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them together to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this territory in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The dish, or sometimes it is also called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario, from the Great Lakes to Quebec and from Lake Simcoe into the United States. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory with one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table, representing that we must keep the peace. This was a treaty made between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee after the French and Indian War. Newcomers were then incorporated into it over the years, notably in 1764 with the Royal Proclamation or the Treaty of Niagara. Foreign Shirt Day is an event created in 2013 designed to educate and promote awareness in Canada about the residential school system and the impact it has had on Indigenous communities for over a century, an impact recognized as cultural genocide and an impact that continues today. It is held annually on September 30th in Canadian communities, especially in schools with students and staff where people are encouraged to wear an orange shirt. The inspiration for Orange Shirt Day came from residential school survivor Phyllis Jack Webstad, who shared her story at a St. Joseph Mission residential school commemoration project and reunion event held in Williams Lake, British Columbia in the spring of 2013. Phyllis recounted her first day of residential schooling at six years old when she was stripped naked and her new orange shirt bought by her grandmother was taken away from her and never returned which symbolizes how the residential school system took away the indigenous identity of its students. My own grandmother was taken away from her family at the age of six and taken a long way away. She did not see her family for nearly 12 years, and this impacted her and her children and her grandchildren. I didn't know anything about my native heritage until I was in my late teens. Suffice to say that denial was not a river in Egypt in my family. Though I didn't grow up in the culture or on the reserve, eventually I did get very involved in my culture, especially in following the traditions and through my artwork. As well, I became very involved in various community events and organizations. One of the reasons why I am currently the Indigenous advisor to Street Art Toronto Reconciliation is not a buzzword, not just a flavor of the month or the year. Reconciliation is not just about saying one is sorry or that one can forgive. It requires more than just words. It is about taking action, reconciliation. It is not up to Indigenous Canadians to figure out how to make reconciliation work. Time and time again, Indigenous Canadians have gone to the non-Natives. Now it is time for non-natives to come to indigenous people. It's time. The conversation is needed, but on indigenous terms. Don't expect indigenous people to get over it or even jump up and down when their traditional territories are finally acknowledged in the schools. It's about time, actually. Reconciliation should be tied to the land that indigenous people are connected to. This is the time for climate change of a different matter a change in the climate of thought, of approach, of behavior, 
And maybe now is the time, as we are now in a new climate of change. We need to refloat or right the canoe that is Canada, especially as we work towards reconciliation. This is both hope and challenge for us. What we strive towards is a real possibility for a shared future to remind Canadians that we are all in the same canoe and to make this country work, we should all be paddling together. Will truth bring reconciliation? Justice Marie Sinclair says not without education. The TRC recommends the history of residential schools be added to all educational material so that future generations know the story. Justice Murray Sinclair said, but in addition to that, the way that schools treat Indigenous history also needs to be reevaluated and rethought and recast. The beginning of history for Canadian students generally begins with the arrival of the Europeans. There is no history taught about the period before 1492, and that's crazy, because there's a whole rich history there that we should be talking about, says Justice Murray Sinclair. We have all been taught to believe in Aboriginal inferiority and European superiority, and that's wrong, Justice Murray Sinclair. Hello, Osgood Hall. Uh, I brought my All Nation Juniors with me. We're very honored to do an honor song for you guys today. To open up your uh, movie day in Indian War, celebrating your one shirt day. Uh, but before we sing the song, I just want to thank you guys for your previous years and your previous donations to Toronto Council Fire and the Residential School Survivor Program. Okay, uh, so we prepared, uh, we're going to sing a Goldie Oldie. We're going to sing Red Bull Singers. And then uh, when the movie's over, we're also going to sing this song. I hope you guys enjoyed the movie. This movie is going to pull on your heartstrings. It's going to bring awareness.
this uh, movie brings you guys some awareness on residential schools and what's actually happening. Welcome everyone to the Street Art Toronto Scarlet Road Concrete Barrier Mural Site. We are literally standing in a field of 473 concrete cycle track art barriers. Toronto is home to some of the best street, mural and graffiti artists and art in the world. These artists and their artworks have transformed Toronto's public streets, laneways, parks and even cycle tracks into a citywide year-round art gallery. And it really does take a village to make projects of this size and complexity come to fruition. My name is Carolyn Taylor, and I'm here with my Street Art Toronto colleague Michael Hutchinson and others who are going to share with you a little bit about the complex process of transforming these important pieces of infrastructure into a celebration of diversity, inclusion, and knowledge sharing across communities as well as a vibrant and uplifting highlight of residents' daily commute. Michael? Street Art Toronto, also known as START, is an initiative of the City of Toronto Transportation Services Division and is a suite of innovative programs that showcase, celebrate and support street, mural and graffiti artists throughout Toronto. START is a small but mighty team that includes Carolyn and myself, along with Catherine Campbell, Jason Campbell, and our manager, Randy McLean. START programs and projects are rooted in a set of values that demonstrate the positive and powerful impacts of diversity and inclusion, foster community engagement and civic pride, add color and vitality to neighborhoods, encourage active transportation, showcase Toronto's artists and contribute to their skills development, mentor emerging talent, and create opportunities for positive engagement amongst residents, business owners and operators, artists and arts organizations. Here to tell you more about the complex process of creating art on mobile infrastructure is the 2020 Street Art Toronto Cycle Track Curator, Cindy Scaife. Cindy, over to you. I'm Cindy Scaife and along with Natalie Berry B, we are co-curating this project for the City of Toronto and Street Art Toronto. This is the Scarlet Road Cycle Track Barrier Mural Project. We have 473 barriers, custom designed concrete barriers, and we have just hit 141 artists that are creating murals for the barriers. I paint under the name Dude Man. Got approached to paint on some of the street barriers and some of the street art projects. Uh, show up and do a good job. Make it a good, a good experience for the people, for yourself, for the people who view it, for the people who are putting it on. Just, it's a great opportunity. This project has grown. We, our first project was a pilot project on uh, Lakeshore and we had 114 barriers and I think around 30 artists worked on that. So that was an interesting uh, process and we've learned a lot since then. Hi, my name is Gosha. Uh, I'm an artist and I've done a lot of work for Street Art Toronto. One of the projects that mm, is very interesting that we're working on right now is the uh, bicycle barriers. The first time I participated in this project was for the Lakeshore bike barriers. Those ones were not done in a yard, they were done on, an, on the street. Um, which was a little bit difficult. Whereas now they've moved everything um, to this yard, which is safe um, and it's great to work here. Um, you also actually get to see a lot of the artists a little bit more instead of being so spread out. Earlier this year, I was asked if I wanted to head up the prep crew. And I'm just like, absolutely. I'll head this up, we will get you a great product. That's what I was after. The devised plan was Everything gets rinsed as it's wet. Two guys, two employees with phosphoric acid to etch the concrete. Then you got three people with scrub brushes to grind that in. After that, every single one has to be pressure washed to remove every bit of residue. Otherwise you're painting on dust. Your paint's gonna stick to the dust, not the substrate we're going for. And they dried. Then the crew gets on there and primes it with a special concrete 
primer for freshly etched and rinsed concrete. Now we're on the other end of things. Finished artwork, give them a nice rinse, let that dry and then do the graffiti, anti-graffiti top coating. It's been a smooth machine, it's going down really well. Good experience, good people. So this is our third project and our, by far our largest project. And it's just getting better and better each time we undertake this new uh, form of public art. We also are fortunate uh, to have several Indigenous artists with us on this project and we're excited to be able to highlight Orange Shirt Day. As with all of our artists, we've given them a prompt in a, th a theme and then we've given them the opportunity to approach that theme in whatever way feels best and works best with their artistic vision and style. So with our Indigenous artists, they've all approached it with a, a lens that they look through of an Indigenous voice. So we're excited to have them on the project and highlight their particular visions and backgrounds. My name is Q Rock. I'm a b-boy uh, graffiti artist and I also paint murals. I work with Street Art Toronto. Um, I'm Anishinaabe from Nipissing First Nations. And um, this project for the Barriers project that I'm doing right now, I've, uh, I've included like my Anishinaabe approaches to circular thinking and uh, past, present, future teachings. The barriers I was asked to do were about fossils. Uh, my name is Danny Coughlin. My indigenous ancestry is very distant and it's small. Um, even though I'm not 100% Indigenous, I'm learning that I'm learning how to be Indigenous in spirit. And I'm on a new journey of I'm learning and relearning who I am and remembering who I am. And in that process, decolonizing my mind, my body, my spirit, my heart. And it's quite an experience. We don't have a written language. Everything is passed on through arts, storytelling, painting, dancing. So um, the approaches that I have were taught to me um, to share uh, the connection, the interconnection with everything, how, how all things are connected, and um, to also show the spirit in things. The things that we can't see is what I try to paint. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer three years ago, right after I graduated from teacher's college, um, which is when I learned about my um, distant Indigenous background. Um, in between all those surgeries and while I was adjusting to my treatment, I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna paint and draw. And it was, it was my survival mode and it helped heal me immensely. And it's changed my life. We have divided the project into four zones which are flora, fauna, and fossils, and the last one is fables. So this is supposed to be a starting point for the artist to be inspired to, when they create their layouts. Some are very literal and others are inspired by their uh, cultural backgrounds and or they're totally ma made up fables. My name is Ksenia uh, and my theme is flora. Actually, I was very happy about it because uh, my own artistic practice is inspired by Central Asian patterns uh, and designs. I'm from Uzbekistan and, um, and flora actually speaks uh, just so perfectly for this because uh, many of our um, Traditional patterns are inspired by the natural world. And so I chose personally uh, pomegranate for mine for this time, because pomegranate is a very auspicious um, uh, symbol in our culture. Uh, that means uh, abundance, it means abundance of the universe, it means fertility, it means uh, life. Uh, and it's not only what I like about pomegranate, it's not only about our culture, but it's also, it literally can be found uh, from Greece, throughout Central Asia, along the Silk Road, uh, all the way to China. So I felt that not only it will speak to people from my part of the world, it will speak also to many other cultures who uh, would recognize and appreciate it. So my theme um, that I've been given is fables. Um, and I have two barriers I'm painting two this time. Um, it's gonna be two, it's the fable of two dogs. 
Um, it's the one where a dog sees his reflection and tries to fight it. Uh, but I've changed it to foxes because <laughs> I couldn't pick a dog. <laughs> so now I'm doing two foxes reflecting on each other. <laughs> what I did for this project is uh, I looked up what kinds of insects are indigenous along Scarlet Road. So beetles and crickets I'm focusing on. And I title this The Sounds of Insects because my um, almost nine year young child, who he's turning nine on Tuesday, we're writing our own little fable, The Sounds of Insects. And it's gonna be very short, just like two pages long, we're gonna record it. So this is kind of like the inception of it. We're excited to have the barriers placed on Scarlet Road and have the community get to see everyone's artwork. We, I really appreciate uh, the fact that it's marrying the functionality with aesthetics. So not only it does provide safety to the cyclist, which is important to me as a cyclist, but also as you cycle, you also get to appreciate many different art artworks. Especially for this project, I think it's extremely impressive that there are more than 130 artists, I believe. And uh, yeah, to me, it's very exciting just to be part of it. Well, the barriers definitely provide safety, right? Um, but also, it, instead of just having concrete blocks, it's nice to have some sort of, you know, color, some sort of interest for for the community. Um, anyone that's passing by, anyone who might be walking, cycling, or driving, um, it's nice. It's a nice thing to have. <laughs> They've learned about scale and impact. Now they have an opportunity. So people who are usually in their sketchbooks are able to come out on a scale and they don't have to take issue with uh, some of the factors that the late night people may have entertained. So I, I, I think it's welcoming. I, I'm welcoming it. I think it's good for them. There's a place for it. With this project in particular, because it's so large, um, I envision that the community will be able to visit it often and their favorite barriers will change over time because there's such a variety so um, it's almost like having a outdoor art gallery it turns out to be a destination for people to come and see this really unique uh, public art installation and that also acts to keep bicyclists safe and make sure that the vehicles are aware of where bicyclists are so it's going to benefit the community in many ways and also brings a little bit of color into the neighborhood that maybe was lacking. It's inspiring to see so many artists, so many different styles come together. Like no matter what, no matter what, when you look around, it's all around you. So it's inspiring to see other people out there that are painting as well and, you know, all contributing to create, uh, you know, a positive environment for our city and the people that live in it. Being able to cycle and to feel protected and safe while cycling in a big city, not only does this make cyclists feel safe, but it also reminds cyclists to remember the significance of like the title of, of nature and the stories and the wisdom that nature speaks to us and to pay a little bit, to pay a lot more attention to what nature has to say to us because there's a lot of healing that needs to be, be done. And so art itself, like doing it, creating it, sharing it is so incredibly healing on multiple dimensions. And I think that this can do that for a lot of people in this city. I believe that this project truly represents Toronto because there's a diverse range of artistic styles and subject matter and also a diverse range of artists that are working on the project. It's something that Toronto can be very proud of because it's setting the bar high for other cities across Canada and maybe the world to follow and be inspired by. We are more multicultural than a lot of cities. It's good to see that I think there's a lot of diversity going on style-wise as well. There's a uniformity which is e interesting, equally as intriguing. 
it means a lot to me to be here and to be painting something from uh, our part of the world because uh, our diaspora is here in Toronto. It's not maybe probably the biggest, but we are here and I think it means a lot to, to people like us. <laughs> I come from the Bronx, but Toronto has always had a really close place to my heart for how amazing the talent is that comes out of Toronto. It still comes out of here, it's still here to this day. During this particular time for the country with COVID, um, I think it gave everybody a boost to come together as a community to build something and create something beautiful for our city. Coming here to do this project is, it's just an outstanding opportunity to learn and to be surrounded by so many gifted artists. People bring their game and there's that's not something to be judged on. They showed up, they did their job. They did a good job. Our young people are taking that culture back. That, that they tried to take away. So uh, we got another old song here. It's from AIM, it's called the AIM song. And uh, I was singing this song because during that time when AIM came around, they brought that spirit back. They brought that culture back. They brought it to the reservations, they brought it to the nations. And this song was all part of that. So we're gonna sing that song.
Thank you. Play that song. Let's go. This is our All Nation Juniors. Dakota, Dakota, Kaylin, Joey, Danny, Kiki, and Sage, and myself, Kevin Myron. Have a good day, you guys.